Okay, my name is uh, Philip Bridges. I am faculty in animal science, uh, research faculty. My specialty is in reproductive physiology. Uh, these are my heifers that are hopefully going to help explain some of the stuff we're talking about today. So I wanted to really go over how we think manipulating the form of selenium, which you supply to your cattle, because remember we're in a selenium deficient area, how that can affect fertility, okay? Before I even get to selenium, I wanted to give you some background around about embryo development, ovarian function, which is going to really tie together how we can manipulate reproductive function to our advantage. So as far as fertility goes, obviously we've got an oocyte coming out of the ovary at ovulation. It's going to get fertilized in the oviduct about the next day. Then it's going to spend two, three, four days developing as it progresses through the oviduct. Now these are simple cleavage divisions. One cell splits in two, two to four, four to eight, etc. Around day five, that developing embryo is going to enter the uterus. Okay, now this is a period of rapid growth. It's developing through a morula, which is a compacted group of cells, to a blastocyst, which you're probably familiar with, where you would have a defined inner cell mass, which is going to become the embryo proper, and the trophectoderm, which is going to become the extra embryonic membranes and form part of the placenta. Now about day 10, after breeding, that embryo was going to hatch out of the eggshell or the zona pellucida. For this whole 10 day period, it's been confined in that little eggshell, same as when it ovulated. After that, it undergoes a rapid period of elongation and actually then has to signal to mum that it's there so she can maintain that pregnancy. It's not until weeks later that a placenta is going to develop. So the big question is, what is nourishing that uterus as it goes from a single cell to basically an elongated blastocyst, okay? And that is secretions from the uterus, okay? What we've known for many years is that the level of progesterone is going to affect the secretions produced by the uterus, which is going to nurture this embryo. Okay, so now we're going to go back to ovary and uterine function and begin to tie this together. Prior to breeding, all there is on the ovary is a follicle producing increasing amounts of estradiol. Okay, that estradiol is going to trigger estrous behaviour. It's also going to induce the process of ovulation. Once that oocyte's released, again into the oviduct where fertilisation can occur, the residual cells from that follicle that were producing estradiol differentiate into the corpus luteum, whose role is to produce progesterone, the only steroid hormone required for pregnancy, okay? Now that embryo is going to hit the uterus around day five, which is the time that corpus luteum is dramatically growing. Now the follicle, is a hollow structure, fluid filled. The corpus luteum is bigger and much more solid. A lot of hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the cells going on, and the rate of growth is actually analogous to a tumor. It's one of the most rapidly growing transient endocrine organs in the body. Anything that rapidly growing is going to be metabolically active, okay? Our main way of overcoming the byproduct of a metabolically active tissue, which is free radicals, hydrogen peroxide and the like, is a group of proteins called selenoproteins, which are derived from selenium, and they act as antioxidants. They basically convert hydrogen peroxide to water, which protects the integrity of the cells. So right at the time when that embryo was requiring requiring increasing progesterone, we have this corpus luteum undergoing massive changes generating these free radicals, so we need to protect the integrity of this structure. 
Okay, so we have that embryo has arrived into the uterus. Now under the influence of estradiol, those few days before estrus where estradiol was increasing, uterine glands, which are invaginations of the endometrial epithelium of the uterus, are growing. Same happens in women, same happens in everything else, okay? So estradiol causes these uterus, uterine glands to grow and then a few days later, once that corpus luteum is formed, progesterone causes them to secrete what we collectively call a histotrope, which is nourishing that developing embryo at this critical time. Now bear in mind that fertilization rates are pretty high. Now the losses, the majority of the losses are occurring in that first three, four week period before there's a placental attachment, okay? For probably 30 years, we've known there's a very small window of time, around day six, seven of past, past breeding, where the level of progesterone produced by that corpus luteum has a dramatic effect on development of the embryo. It nourishes it better, it advances embryo development, sets that conceptus up to better signal to mum that it's there so the pregnancy can be maintained. Okay. And that's where the selenium comes in. Purely by luck, we found out that manipulating the form of selenium we provide to these cattle to achieve just a selenium adequate status was affecting the level of progesterone produced by this developing corpus luteum just at the time that we knew was critical for advancing embryonic development. Now all the prior research was artificially manipulating progesterone to increase the levels. What we've found was just by changing the form of selenium, we get a natural increase in progesterone. Mechanism is still being worked out, but that is going to equate to pushing that embryo along better, increasing its chances of survival. The first thing I wanted to do as a researcher when I understood that was work out the mechanism in that corpus luteum responsible for that. Because if we understand the mechanism, then we can use that knowledge to advance our collective understanding of how fertility can be managed better. So you would naturally think that it's an increase in progesterone synthesis. Now progesterone synthesis by the corpus luteum is very straightforward. It starts off with star protein, which is uh, considered the rate limiting step. It transports cholesterol to the inner mitochondrial membrane of the luteal cell. Cholesterol, a 27 carbon entity, is then converted to pregnenolone. 21 carbons via an enzyme called cytochrome P450 side chain cleavage, which is then converted to progesterone from another enzyme called 3-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. So we looked at all these enzymes, the associated receptors, no difference, which didn't make sense because for several years we'd seen this effect of increased progesterone, which meant it was either upstream or downstream. We chose first to look at upstream, which is basically the cholesterol availability. And we found a whole group of enzymes, proteins, involved in the cascade of cholesterol influx into that cell that were upregulated depending on the form of selenium. So the increase in progesterone is not from the steroidogenic ability per se, but the availability of cholesterol to those luteal cells. The downstream end, which still could be influencing, is the liver. Progesterone, although it's secreted in massive quantities, it actually has a relatively short half-life, about 30 minutes. It's catabolized by the liver. So we still have to address that. But now we're getting a good understanding of how it works at the corpus luteum. Our next step, which is utilizing the girls that ran out over there, was looking at how that then affects these uterine glands. Are they truly producing more of this histotroph, this nourishing uh, collective of nutrients, or is there some other mechanism in play? Once we've done that, we'll have a real good understanding of why. 
Now to get back to the selena protein and the forms of selenium, typically most producers are using an inorganic form of selenium. Okay? Uh, places like Alltex are selling an organic form. Now cattle are naturally eating organic form because the selenium is in the soil. Soil turns into the grass, they eat the grass. Okay? But what we found was that a mixture of the two, an equal mixture, one part inorganic, one part organic, induces this increase in progesterone compared to just the organic form or the inorganic form, which is hard to put your mind around some ways. Now again, the selenium is incorporated into selena proteins. That corpus luteum is undergoing massive growth and metabolic function, so it's inducing these free radicals which these selena proteins are trying to clear up. So the timing matches really well. Okay. So once we've covered the endometrial side and the embryo development side, then we can then begin to take that further and look at whether this is a carryover, an epigenetic effect, whether we need to have our animals on a particular supplement all year or part of the year, we can start tinkering with the levels. But at the moment, we're at the stage of how these different forms are affecting ovarian, uterine, embryo function, so that we can begin to make recommendations to you, the producer, as how to best supplement your animals to get increased fertility.